hey, y'all, since it's almost the end of the year and almost the end of season two, I thought that I would throw out some of the bigger, more popular episodes from this year. So tonight, what I'm giving y'all is all three parts that I've done so far of the Alex Murdoch case. Um, so it's going to be kind of lengthy and don't turn it off after each part or whatever. It's all merged together so you get it all at one time and I hope y'all enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to an all new episode of Mystery Murder and Mayhem. Tonight's episode comes to us straight from South Carolina and unless you've been living under a rock you've probably heard at least some of what I'll be talking about tonight because it's been going on for quite a while now. That's the Alex Murdoch case. I've been wanting to talk about this on here for a while, but I was trying to hold off until Murdoch was tried and sentenced, but more and more just keeps popping up surrounding him, so I think it's time. Plus, my mama's making me do it. No, not really, but she's been hanging on every word that comes out about it, and honestly, I should probably just let her do this episode because she knows more about it than I do. But I've been putting in some work, learning more about it, and tonight I'm going to let y'all know everything that I've learned about this case up until this point in time. So let's get started. Now, if you're not from the Southeast, you may not have ever heard of the Murdoch family, but it's a name that I can remember hearing over the years since I was a little kid. Now, the Murdochs, they're a prominent family of attorneys here in South Carolina, particularly the Low Country, and since 1920, three generations of their family have served as South Carolina. 14th Circuit solicitors, and what that means is that they're the top prosecutors representing Beaufort, Jasper, Hampton, Allendale, and Colleton counties. Kind of like what they call district attorneys, I think, in other states. Now, however, Alex was never a solicitor, but he was a lawyer in that family's law firm. Now, Alex, he was born as Richard, I believe Alexander was his middle name, Murdoch. He attended the University of South Carolina Law School. And while he was there, he played on the football team. And once he graduated, he practiced civil law. And at one point, he was a volunteer assistant solicitor under his father. He lived what was, by all accounts and appearances, a seemingly perfect life. He had money, cars, and I'm sure women at one time, you know, when probably his early college years. Um, and he split his time between the family estate, and a beach home on Edisto. So life was good. Well, in August of 1993, Alex married his college sweetheart, Maggie. And together, the couple had two sons, Richard Jr., who somewhere along the line picked up the nickname Buster, which I believe was one of his grandfather's names. And then uh, he Buster has a little brother named Paul. And like I said, life was good. 
that don't last forever because you know we know that all good things must come to an end and if the murdoch name wasn't known by most a downward spiraling of events would change all of that all right so fast forward a few years and alex's son paul he's 19 years old and on the night of february 23rd 2019 Paul decides to take his friends out for a night of partying on the Beaufort River in the family boat. And when I say a night of partying, I'm talking about alcohol flowing freely for a boat boatload. <laughs> almost a boatload, but a boatload of underage kids. And on board the boat that night was Paul and his girlfriend Morgan Doty, um, a couple named Miley Altman and Connor Cook and a third couple named Mallory Beach and her boyfriend, Anthony Cook. And Anthony and Connor, they're cousins. And you might ask how all these kids, being underage, were able to obtain alcohol. They had no trouble getting fake IDs, and they even had a borrowed ID because Paul was using his brother Buster's ID to purchase alcohol. So around 8 p.m. that night, they docked the boat at Paul Key Island, for an oyster roast. I swear I can't talk today. And they stayed there until about midnight. And during that time, it had grown dark and foggy. But the three couples set out on the boat for downtown Beaufort. And once they made it there, Paul and Connor went into a bar on the waterfront while the rest of the group decided to hang out at a nearby park. Well, those two stayed in the bar until about 1.15 a.m., and then rejoin their friends and from there this is where things took a very ugly turn now some of the others who were on the boat that night said that paul's behavior was horrifying and it's been said that anytime he was drunk his behavior was very horrifying and they even gave that personality that he had um when he was drinking the nickname timmy and timmy was coming out well he was driving erratically and he was doing donuts in the water with the boat and at one point connor took over driving for a few minutes but paul took back control of the boat saying it was his boat and he slammed the throttle so the boat was traveling at a pretty high rate of speed well around 2:20 that morning calls started coming into the 911 center there and the boat that had the three young couples that you know they had been riding on the river that boat had slammed into a bridge near Paris Island on Archer's Creek. And everybody was accounted for except for Mallory Beach. Mallory Beach, she was nowhere to be found, and the group that had been with her was hysterical. Well, I should say the group, with the exception of Paul, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, her boyfriend, Anthony, told the deputy who had arrived that Mallory was missing, and Paul had been the one driving the boat when it crashed he went on to tell the officer that paul was the son of alec murdoch kind of giving him the heads up that you're gonna have a tough one with this because of who his family is and as anthony's talking to the police he sees paul approaching with a big old smile on his face and so anthony's you know here he is frantic because his girlfriend is missing and here comes Paul walking up with his big old smile on his face. And so they had a verbal confrontation and the police had to end up breaking it up. But Paul had lost his phone, so he ended up using one of the EMT's phones. But he don't call his mom or dad. He calls his grandfather. And he tells him that he wasn't driving the boat. And he goes on to say that it was Connor who had been driving the boat. Well, y'all, I'm just sad to say that it would be eight days before Mallory was ever located. Um, her body was finally recovered at a boat ramp five miles from where the crash had taken place. Now, can you imagine the horror that her family was going through when this search was going on for eight days? I just can't even fathom not knowing where my kid is for eight days and then finally finding, you know, that they're dead. But, um, anyway, back to the scene of, you know, of all this going on. 
Now, you know, the kids are taken to a hospital that's in the area, and Alex Murdoch, he shows up, and his behavior at the hospital was very questionable because at the hospital after the crash, he was going from room to room where these kids were being treated for their injuries, trying to talk to his son's friends. And I'm, from what I've gathered, he was telling these kids, you know, or I guess he was trying to get them to all be on the same page about what they were going to tell the cops. And there's been a lot of speculation that it was just to cover up what had happened so that Paul wouldn't get into trouble. Well, the hospital stop, staff, they had to stop him from entering the other kids' rooms. And get this, as Connor's being taken into surgery for a broken jaw and he had these horrible lacerations on his face, Alex is walking along as he's being pushed to the operating room, telling him not to say anything. As in, don't rat my boy out. And in a deposition... Connor even stated that Alex had told him that he didn't have to tell anyone who had been driving the bait. Now, while Alex is walking around showing his ignorance, or I really don't want to say ignorance, but I guess his privilege, you know, um, his son Paul is raising hell in his room in the ER. And at the hospital, Paul's alcohol, blo uh, blood alcohol content level came in at 0.24 which is three times the legal limit. And there's been some questions as to why there wasn't a field sobriety test done by any of the authorities who showed up on the scene of the accident. So it's quite possible that his blood alcohol content level had been even higher than that. And I guess Alice thought that the clout from his family's name was enough to pull a few strings so that his boy wouldn't be punished. But y'all, he was so wrong. He was so very wrong. And just in case you're wondering, because I had thought about this too, and then I later found out that they had, but the Murdochs did attend Mallory's funeral and her burial. So it, maybe that answers a question for you. But um, Mallory's family, they filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the Murdoch family at the end of um, March in 2019. And then three weeks later, on what would have been Mallory's 20th birthday, Paul was charged with boating under the influence resulting in death of Mallory Beach and serious bodily injuries to two of the other passengers, which are all felonies. But Paul pleaded not guilty to those charges. But y'all get this, Paul never even stuck a toe into the county jail. He was never placed in handcuffs. And his mug shot, it was taken in the hallway of the courthouse. And I'm kind of thinking that his his family or his daddy had a little persuasion over him about pleading not guilty. That's just my speculation. But anyway, at the bond hearing, Paul was released on his own recognizance. And one of the conditions of his bond was that he was not to consume any alcohol. But guess who was caught on camera soon after his release at a bar in Columbia, South Carolina, throwing back shots? Yeah. If you guessed, Paul, you were right. Now, it also seems during this time period, Alex and Maggie were having some marital issues. Now, if you ask Murdoch's lawyer, uh, Dick Harpootley, and I believe is his name, he says, no, they were happy. But anyway, friends had noticed that she no longer was stopping by the law office to have lunch with Alex like she had done in the past. And others say that they never saw the two being like, affectionate with each other like a married couple would and like they say money is the root of all evil or at least it was the evil that caused the couple to have these marital issues so maggie went to a charity luncheon she had written a check while she was there but to her horror that check bounced Maggie had no idea there was any financial issues going on she had never had to worry about finances she never gave any thought to the family money or even where it came from. But after that check bounced, she started looking into some stuff. She started checking into some things. And she even questioned Alex about it several times. And he'd just tell her things like, you know, not to worry about it. Or he would figure it out or he would fix it. But apparently it was never fixed. Because sometime like around the end of April of 2021, which was just last year, 
Maggie visited a divorce attorney. And on, we're going to fast forward a month or two. And this is going to be on June 7th, 2021. So Alex contacted Maggie and asked her to meet him at their estate in Islington because his father's health was failing and she needed to see him before he passed away. Well, at this time, Maggie was living at their beach house in Edisto, so she, you know, would have to take a little drive. Now, at first, you know, Maggie suggested that they meet at the hospital. You know, I mean, why would you meet at the house? But later, she did agree to meet at the estate. And even though she was suspicious of his intentions, and she had even texted those suspicions to her friend, telling that friend that, she felt Alex was up to something. Well, her suspicions were right. Now we won't wait for emergency. This is Alex Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just got badly. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Sir? You said 4147 Moselle Road in Allison? Yes, sir. 4147 okay. Roselle Road. Stay on the uh, line with please, me, okay? Hurry. Yes, sir. Stay on the line with me, okay? okay. Connor County sir. Communications. Oh. Collison, I have a Alex Murdoch on the line. Call us from 4147 Moselle Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay, and did you see anyone? Okay, is he breathing at all? No. No. Is she... Okay, do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay, and what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay, and did you hear anything, or did you come home and find them? No, man, I've been gone. I, I just came back. <laughs> okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. <laughs> Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Okay, what is her name? Maggie, Maggie and Paul. Maggie is her name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. Uh, we're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions, don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them is moving. What is your telephone number? And does anything look out of place? Ma'am, not, not particularly, really, no, ma'am. Okay. Are they close, ma'am? Yeah, they're, they've been in route with you ever since uh, you have got on the phone with me. I have multiple people coming out there to you. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't, I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't, I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? I, I already touched them trying to get a, um, to see if they were breathing. 
Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? That was the 911 call that Alex Murdoch placed on that same night. Alex tells 911 operators that he found his wife and child shot very badly out by his dog kennels. And this really doesn't have anything to do with this case, but I guess it kind of does. But did you notice how he sounded offended when he answered the operator after she asked if the home was like a house or a trailer? That part tickled me like he was just like offended and his voice cracked. How dare they think I live in a mobile home or as we call them here in the South, a trailer. I guess not everybody knew the Murdoch name. You know, he tried his best to sound convincing that he had found his estranged wife and son shot to death near the dog kennels at the hunting lodge that the family owned. Now, when the police arrived, Alex told them he had found them out by his kennels when he came home from visiting his sick father. Now, one curious thing that I found, or... <laughs> that was found during the investigation not that i found i'm not on the investigation team but anyway um but something that they found or during the uh investigation or the autopsy was that maggie had been shot with a semi-automatic rifle but paul had been shot with a shotgun so was that something done to throw off the authorities and make it look like there were two different shooters well maybe but these murders took place just three days before paul was to appear in court on those charges he had collected for that boat accident. And to add to the tragedy, just a few days after Paul and Maggie were found deceased, Alex's father passed away at the age of 81. One thing I found odd was that there was no life insurance policies on neither Maggie or Paul. So that rules out the idea that maybe they were killed for insurance money. But it just struck me odd that there was just no insurance on them. And while Maggie's and Paul's murders were being investigated, information was found that pertained to another case in the area. But what that information was that was found, it hasn't been released yet. But the case it relates to is the death of a 19-year-old who was found dead on July the 8th of 2015 on a lonely road in Hampton County in the middle of the night. That 19 year old was Stephen Smith, and his mother said that he had called his sister that night, telling her that he was out of gas and he was going to hide in the woods until he was sure that his sister was there. And at first, it was revealed that the cause of death was a bullet wound to his head and it had been a homicide. But that was quickly and mysteriously changed. The coroner's report then said that Stephen had died from blunt force trauma to the head most likely caused by a mirror from a passing car. A law enforcement official from Hampton County, he's not satisfied with that being the cause of death. I watched um, this three-part miniseries on Discovery Plus called The Murdoch Murderers Deadly Dynasty. And he said that he's been doing his own investigating. And I wish I could remember that man's name, but right now it that name escapes me but he said he's been doing his own investigating which has included searching the road that Stephen was killed on and he could not find one piece of debris from a car and it seems to me that if a mirror on a car hit someone hard enough to kill him there would be at least a tiny piece of that mirror laying somewhere on that road and Stephen's mom has never agreed that you know that what they're telling makes any sense she says it just don't add up and so far no member of the murdoch family has been implicated in this case but like i said some type of information was found about stephen's case during the, uh, that investigation into maggie's and paul's murders and at that point sled which is the state law enforcement division here in south carolina they opened an investigation into stephen's death now, one thing I'd like to mention, though, is that WCSC reported that information received from the Highway Patrol's investigation into Stephen's death revealed that the Murdoch name was brought up many, many times in interviews with Stephen's family and friends. And of course, there's a lot of hearsay that has gone around about Stephen's death, and I don't usually include hearsay in my episodes, but I feel like it might be worth talking about because we might hear more about it later. 
Alex's oldest son was implicated by some of the people interviewed in the investigation into Stephen's death, but y'all get this. Others have said that Paul was involved and struck Stephen with a blunt object while riding by him as a passenger in a vehicle that night. Now, like I said, this part is pure speculation, but it's also been rumored that Buster and Stephen had at one time been in a relationship. None of the hearsay or speculation has been proven or verified as of right now. And so right now I'm just going to make sure to make it known that that all is just hearsay. So I know that was a lot that we've talked about so far. But there's still a lot more. But I want y'all to just settle down a little bit. Let's take a deep breath. And let's do a recap of what's happened so far in this little real life soap opera. Alex's son Paul was charged with several felonies that stemmed from the boat accident that happened while he was under the influence of alcohol. At 19, or a 19 year old woman, her name was Mallory Beach. She was the same age as Paul. At that time of that boat accident, she was killed in the boat accident. Alex's wife, Maggie, she starts looking into their financial assets after a check balances that she had written at a charity luncheon. And we know that six weeks before she and Paul were found dead, she had talked to a divorce attorney. Then all of a sudden, Alex is calling 911 saying he had found his wife and son dead out by his dog kennels. And somewhere in the investigation of Maggie's and Paul's death information, we don't know what information, but information was found that has put a link to the Murdoch family to what is being called the hit and run death of Stephen Smith. And y'all, like I said, there's a lot more to it, but we're going to end it right here for tonight's episode. You'll have to come back next week to hear the rest of it. And it's honestly the stuff that movies and TV shows are made of. And I mean, for real, y'all, who would believe this type of stuff really happens? But unfortunately, it's a true story that's happening right here in South Carolina. Just when we think nothing else could happen in this real-life soap opera, more comes out. And that's what we're going to talk about on next week's episode. Okay, that's it for tonight. I know you probably hear the cats there saying goodnight. And y'all be sure to come back next week for the next part of the Days of Our Murdochs. And be sure to come back on Friday night for What the Friday. Good evening and welcome to episode 81 of Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem. I hope your week and your weekend was awesome. And I have to say, our weekend, it was pretty good. Saturday morning, I got up and I decided to do some door dashing. So I had my youngest son, Nick, with me. And a lot of times when I'm not getting these back-to-back orders, which I prefer, but anyway, it's going to happen. Um, I sit in the Walmart parking lot and I do a little people watching. But on Saturday... Me and Nick were sitting there, and I was like, well, let's ride around a little bit. So we ride around in the area, and I guess the universe had just been telling me, hey, you know, you need to go do this, because we found a little puppy that had had to have been abandoned, because where he was at, there was just no way that he wandered there by himself, because he's just so little. Now, he's been scanned. I took him over to the vet's office that Courtney and Alice work in, and... He has no chip, but anyway, today he got his first puppy shots and he got a flea treatment and he's been dewormed and we named him Philip. He looks like he's a corgi mixed with maybe some chihuahua, but he is adorable. And if you follow us on Facebook, I posted a picture of him on Saturday, but anyway, 
Ariel's a big sister now, and she kind of likes him. Um, she'll get used to him. Uh, she, she's not too hateful or anything, but, you know, she's an old girl. Uh, so, you know, she was the only doggie, and now she's, she's got a little brother. But anyway, so as you may recall, last week I brought you the first part of the Days of Our Murders. And today I'm bringing you part two. Now, here's a recap of what we talked about last week. So Alex, the son, Paul, he was charged with several felonies that stemmed from the boat accident that happened while he was under the influence of alcohol. A 19 year old girl named Mallory Beach. Now that's the same age that Paul was when this happened. Um, she was killed in that boat accident. Alex's wife, Maggie, she started looking into their financial assets after a check that she had written at this charity luncheon and bounced. Then all of a sudden, Alex is calling 911 saying that he had found his wife and son dead out by his dog kennels. And we know that six weeks before she and Paul were found dead, she had talked to a divorce attorney. Well, somewhere in the investigation of Maggie's and Paul's death, information which we don't know what that information was but anyway information was found that has put a link to the murdoch family to what is being called a hit and run death of stephen smith so that brings us up to date of what we talked about last week so let's get started with this week's exciting part of the murdoch saga Are you not here to be my mayor? But for the So, like I said, towards the end of last week's episode, Alex Murdoch had found his wife and son shot to death out by his dog kennels. And during the investigation of that, information was found that reopened the investigation into the supposed hit and run death of Stephen Smith. Now, like I said, too, when I give that little recap, we don't know what that information was that they found, but it had to be something that maybe, just maybe, linked the Murdoch somehow to the death of Stephen Smith. Well, eight days after Paul and Maggie were found shot to death, Alex and his remaining son, Buster, they announced that they were offering a $100,000 reward for information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of whoever was responsible for the deaths of Maggie and Paul. The sled established a tip line for receiving tips and information on their deaths. But to be eligible to receive that award, you couldn't be a member of law enforcement and you had to either submit your your tip either to the sled hotline or tip line um, or by calling the Crime Stoppers by the 
end of September of 2021. I don't think I've ever heard of an expiration date on submitting tips to get a reward. But anyway, um, this, you know, as, as you can tell, is not your cookie cutter crime. I mean, it's been twists and turns, plot twists after another. So who knows? But not a whole lot happened big through that summer. But then in September, when September rolled around, it was announced on the third that Alex had resigned from the family law firm. And that family law firm goes by the uh, act, the initials PMPED. But did he really resign? Multiple news outlets and even a couple of documentaries that I've watched give us reason to believe that he didn't resign. But he was forced to maybe to resign from the family law firm after it was found out that he had embezzled money from the company and that he had scammed clients out of money as well. But whether he was actually, you know, forced to quit or if he just quit on his own, this wasn't in the Murdoch drama. Hampton County 911, what is your emergency? Oh, no, I'm Salkahatchee Road. Okay, what's the address on Salkahatchee Road? I'm by the church. Uh, what church? Here? What church are you talking about? Uh, I don't know the name of it with the red roof. Okay, what end of Salkahatchee Road? Because I don't know what you're talking about. Um, at the Hampton County side. Okay, what's going on? I stop. I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes, but okay. I mean, I'm okay. You shot where? Where were you shot at? Huh? Did they actually shoot you, or they tried to shoot you? They shot me, but... Uh Okay, wait, you need EMS? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I, I can't drive. Okay. I'm and I'm bleeding a lot. Where, where part of your body? Uh, I'm not sure, somewhere on my head. Your head? Somewhere on my head. Somebody just stopped for me, ma'am, um, for 911. Okay, still? Hey. Okay, let me speak to him, see if he can tell me exactly where you are. Church. Okay. Yeah, hurry, please. Okay, and what's your name? I'm still here. I'm going to stay on the line with you. What's your name? Alex Murdoch. Alex Murdoch? Yes, ma'am. And you see you were driving, you got a flat tire, somebody stopped to help you, and they shot you? Well, they pulled over, yes, ma'am, like they were going to help me. Okay, stay on the line with me. We're going to get some. I'm bleeding pretty bad. Okay. St. John's Missionary Church. St. John Missionary Church? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And can you give me a description of the person that shot you or shot at you? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it was a... Uh, uh, a white fella, uh, I'd say a white male, me. a fair amount younger than me, uh, really, really short hair. Um, you have an ambulance coming, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stay on the line. I got them on the way. You think one of y'all can drive me to the hospital? Y'all could get in this car and drive me? They're going to drive me to the hospital. Ma'am?
ma'am? I'm still here, sir. They, they're on the way. Don't hang, don't hang up. Now, what you just heard was part of a 911 call that Alex Murdoch placed on the morning after he announced that he had resigned from his family's law firm. Some of his audio is a little hard to hear, but it's clear that at first he said his supposed assailant had tried to shoot him, but then he changed it to say that he had been shot. Now, it could be that because he was just, he was truly shot. Maybe he was just wasn't thinking clearly, or maybe it was a slip of the tongue that he didn't mean to make. But, so the story goes that he was changing a flat tire on a road in Hampton County when a stranger pulled up to help him change the flat tire. But when he turned his back on the stranger, they shot him. And apparently the stranger, according to Murdoch at that time, had gotten away. Now, hospital records that were obtained by the Daily Beast showed that Murdoch suffered from, quote, two superficial appearing bullet wounds to the posterior scalp, a skull fracture, and brain bleeding. And when he arrived at the ER, he had also complained of having an excruciating headache, and I imagine he would, and he had temporarily lost some vision. And get this, y'all, he had opioids and barbiturates in his system and two days or after two days of being in the hospital including being in ICU he was released from the hospital and the hospital's findings did shot, shed a little bit of light on just how severe those injuries were and even dispelled that the injury was self-inflicted but what it didn't show or even give a clue into was who had pulled the trigger of a 38 revolver that day so now Alex is out of the hospital recuperating and maybe his conscience starts eating at him. Maybe. Or maybe it's just that the authorities are telling him that they're not buying his story. But whatever caused it, nine days after the shooting, he confesses that he had orchestrated the entire thing in an attempt to get a $10 million payout for his one remaining son, Buster. And according to Alex, he had enlisted the help of his drug dealer, a man named Curtis Edward Smith. And he says that it was Smith that shot him in the head. Now, Murdoch, Murdoch and Smith were charged with a ton of charges. And I mean a ton. And it ranged in charges from, um, including, it was like assisted suicide and insurance fraud. There's a bunch of other charges that went with it. But now, Curtis Edward Smith, he has a whole different story about what had happened. And he says he was set up to be the fall guy in all of this. Smith has said that, even like in these televised interviews he's been in, he said that he refused to shoot him, and he doesn't believe that Murdoch was shot at all. I mean, he was clearly shot somehow. But anyway, um... He went on to say that if he had actually shot at Murdoch, he would be dead. And he admits that he did meet up with Alex on that Hampton County Road on September the 4th. And when he arrived, he was holding the gun up. That is, Alex was holding the gun up. Now, remember how I just said he didn't believe that Alex was even shot? Well, in this story event, of events, he said that after he told Alex that he would not shoot him, he tried grabbing the gun away from him, and in the process of that, the gun accidentally went off. And in another interview, he said that he was a thousand percent sure that the gun didn't hit either of them. Now, it just makes me, y'all, I hate to give my opinions on stuff, but you know I got to, um... Kind of makes me think this dude's tripping a little bit because it was clear that Alex had actually been injured according to the hospital records. And Sled is not 
talking a whole lot about this whole thing, but according to an arrest affidavit, Murdoch was, quote, supply, he supplied Mr. Smith with a firearm and directed Mr. Smith to shoot him in the head. The affidavit also mentioned that Murdoch did confess to the scheme naming Smith as the shooter, and that prompted Smith to confess that he had gotten rid of the weapon that was used in that shooting. Smith denied being Murdoch's drug dealer, but he was also charged with the distribution of methamphetamine and possession of marijuana. Now, Smith also appears to be a bit offended that he was only known as Murdoch's drug dealer. And to hear him tell it on a couple of the recent different TV shows that I've watched about this, he and Alex were like brothers. And he had been like, they had been like brothers for a really long time, according to Mr. Smith. And maybe that's just his low key way of making an appeal to like any potential jurors that were watching. I don't know that I should, like I said, give my opinion, but I will. <laughs> and I just don't feel like those two guys were ever like brothers. But like I said, that's just my opinion. Now, Murdoch's attorney, Dick Harpootlian, he tells a different story, though. According to Harpootlian, Smith met Murdoch on the side of the road. Murdoch told him that it would look like he had broken down and he wanted Smith to ride by and shoot him. And that's what he did. Now, the bullet didn't penetrate Murdoch's skull, though. Hospital records show that when Murdoch arrived at the hospital, he was sitting in a semi-upright position, and the bleeding had been controlled by some gauze that was had been wrapped around his head. Now, when he was admitted around 1.30 p.m. that day, the record says that he was suffering from critical life-threatening injuries. Well, soon after admitting that he had orchestrated the shooting so that his son, Buster, could collect that $10 million insurance policy, Alex checked himself into an Orlando, Florida rehab. And six weeks into that rehab stay, he was arrested on charges of stealing money from an insurance settlement that was meant for the sons of Murdoch's longtime housekeeper and nanny, Gloria Satterfield. Authorities were told that Satterfield tripped over one of the dogs that belonged to the Murdoch family and then passed away several weeks after she fell. Now, I'm about to play for you the 911 call that Maggie placed, or placed after Satter, uh, um, Satterfield, gosh, had fallen. 911, what was your emergency? Uh, 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, can you give me the address one more time? Make sure I got it right. Yes, 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, what's going on up there? I'm sorry? What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, and you said she's fallen and she's bleeding from the head? Yes. Okay. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she out better inside? Outside. Okay. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not, like, responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Man, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way, me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know if she's responding really. at all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all. Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Um, is she breathing okay? Yes. Is she bleeding from anywhere? Yes, her head. Okay, are you guys able to control the bleeding? No. Can you put a clean rag or anything on it? 
Yeah, I got it. Okay, is she bleeding from like her face, the back of the head? I've got an ambulance coming. Sir, my my name was. Where exactly is she bleeding from on her head? I'm not sure, at the top of her head. Okay. Okay. Oh, she, what happened? She just, she just fell back down. Can I get off this phone so I can go down there? Can I have your name and phone number? Or are you able to Thank bring you. the phone down by her? What? Or are you on a cell phone where you can walk down there I'm and on talk? A cell phone, so. Okay, can you bring it with you so we can ask her some questions about what kind of pain she's having? Hello? Yeah, can, can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having? Ma'am, she can't talk. Okay, do you know... She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she's bleeding out of her left ear. Okay, she's bleeding out of her ear? And out of her head, she's cracked her skull. Okay. All right, the other lady said that she had tried to stand up and fell down again? No, she, I was holding her up. And okay. She told me to turn her loose, and she was trying to use her arm, but then she fell back over. Okay. Do you guys know who she is? Yes, yeah, she works for us. Okay. Do you know if she's ever had a stroke or anything before? Ma'am, can you stop asking her to stroke? I already, have them on the way. I already have them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down in any way. These are relevant questions that I have to ask for the ambulance. One of my questions is, has she ever had a stroke? I don't believe she's ever had a stroke, not that I know okay. that. Okay. Okay. Is she able to talk to you guys at all, or is she unconscious now? She's not unconscious. She's just mumbling. Okay. I believe she's maybe hit her head and had, maybe has a concussion or something. Okay. Maybe. Do you know what her name is? Gloria Satterfield. You said Sanderfield? Ma'am? You said Sanderfield? Satterfield. Satterfield. Okay. What's the house look like out there? It's a um, it's offset off the road. Okay. It's a big house, got a long driveway. With a long um, driveway. Yeah. Um, is there a gate or anything down there that they're gonna need to come through? There's two big, big brick columns that have to come through. Okay, but there's no like gate code or anything that they need. No, ma'am. And tell okay. them that they can look for a fellow on a six by six Ranger. Okay. Waiting on them in the road is green. You know what? The, they probably know what the Ranger looks like. Yeah, you said like. Fellas got on a black, got on a black sweater, okay. a hat, and pants. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if if something changes with her, if she loses consciousness or anything like that, I need one of you guys to call me back right away. Okay. Okay. Well, how about how long is it gonna take? Cause this took us. That I don't know. I I've it. had him on the way since. Since Maggie first called me, they were toned right away. Okay. All right, but they're, I think they're coming. Oh, hang on one minute. Let me check. They're coming from somewhere on Belt Highway in Ruffin, okay? That's where their station is. Thank you. All right, but like I said, if something changes, call me back. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That was the call released by SLED on February the 2nd of 2018. Now, after a few weeks in the hospital, sadly, Miss Satterfield passed away due to her injuries. And at the funeral, Alex takes Mrs. Satterfield's sons to the side. And he's like, hey, listen, I've got a plan. I'm going to get y'all some money and take care of y'all. And to get the settlement, what he planned to do was to sue himself on behalf of the Satterfield family. Now, he at some point mentioned to them that they would receive $500,000, but the total amount that came from that settlement was somewhere around $4.3 million. But did the Satterfields ever see that money? No, not even a penny of it. An interesting note about this is that the Hampton County coroner was never called to investigate the debt. And she requested that SLED investigate and find out why she was never called on to, like, review this case since it was considered an accidental death. And get this, y'all. No autopsy was performed after her death 
and her death was marked natural on her death certificate. If that don't sound suspicious, I don't know what does. Well, not only was something suspicious about that, but investigators were soon feeling that something was off about the fallen death of Miss Satterfield. In June of this year, it was announced that there are plans to exhume her body. And Sled has gotten permission from the family of Miss Satterfield to have her exhumed, but at the moment, there just hasn't been a, a date set. Now, that was just back in June that they announced this, so... I don't know how long it takes to get something scheduled like that, but hopefully we'll know something from that very soon. And of course I'll update you when I do, but, um, this Satterfield, she had been the Murdoch's housekeeper and nanny for over, over 20 years y'all. And whether they had any love for her, I have no doubt that she loved that family dearly. I mean, she had to, since she had worked with them for 20 years, she basically saw their kids grow up. And according to her obituary, she had just celebrated her 57th birthday, just 18 days before she died. And one thing that really stood out to me when I was looking at her obituary was in the listing of those who she is survived by, it stated, and those that she loved as her family, Alex and Maggie Murdoch and their family. But y'all, now that family that she had loved and considered family is being investigated in her death. And about that money he scammed her sons out of, it appears that Alex Murdoch pulled a few strings now to get a close friend of his to oversee the estate of Miss Satterfield. And from my understanding, the money was put into this bogus bank account that Alex himself was in control of. And like I said, the Satterfields never received a penny. Murdoch collected on that and apparently he was like stiffing some of his other clients too through the family law firm in November of 2021 more and more fraud cases were being brought to light and he was slapped with 27 charges and indictments that included money laundering breach of trust with fraudulent intent and forgery and the amount that he has been accused of laundering is nearly $5 million, y'all. One of his victims is a highway patrolman who had sought Murdoch's help after he was injured in an on-the-job accident. In January of 2018, Lieutenant Tommy Moore was sitting in his patrol car during a rare snowstorm in the lower part of the of South Carolina. It's, it's very rare that down around Charleston in that area gets any snow. It's really, really rare for any part of South Carolina to get snow, but especially that part of South Carolina. But as he was sitting there, a car slams into his patrol car and basically it drove underneath Morris patrol car, lifted it up and slammed it back down. And in the process of all that, the driver's seat broke loose and it threw more backwards and it caused him a lot of excruciating pain. Well, for months he was going to different doctors and he was being misdiagnosed. But basically, Lieutenant Moore was in fact walking around with a broken neck. And that's when he contacted PMPED, that's the family law firm of the Murdoch's, for some legal help. And Murdoch assured him that money would come. So he had the surgery that he needed to have the neck problem corrected that he was having. And he ended up having a metal disc added at his C5 disc. And at the C6 and C7, they were fused together and a metal plate was added. And I know that was a lot to recover from. Well, eventually, Moore did receive a $100,000 check. And he went straight to see... Alex Murdoch. Well, he, um, that was in January of 2020. Well, Murdoch convinced Mr. Moore to sign over his insurance check to the family law firm. He told Moore that the money couldn't be dispersed until the lawsuit was over and done with. But instead of depositing the money into where it was supposed to be 
deposited to. He deposited into that bogus account that I mentioned earlier. And this bank account has been named in like several other lawsuits against Murdoch. Moore's money supposedly stayed in that account for over three years. And in the meantime, Moore's financial status is bad. I mean, he's got no money coming in. His medical bills are starting to pile up. And then all of a sudden, he gets a call from PMPED. And they're telling him that the check he had signed over to the law firm had been taken. And that they were in the process of replacing that money and it wouldn't be until january of this year 2022 that some of that money would be replaced and get this he didn't even get the full amount because after all murdoch had put him through the law star, that law firm still charged him attorney fees he did receive a check for thirty eight thousand dollars and another 37000 is being held until a worker's comp case is resolved. That's just unbelievable. But um, anyway, that brings us up to this year. But we're not going to go into any more of that until next week. Because like I said, you know, there's so much to this. And I don't want to like skip anything or cut it down for Tom's sake or anything. But um. Yeah, you know, I had originally planned on it being just a two-part series, but there's just, like I said, so much to this case or cases that it's going to be at least three parts, at least three parts. And I'll be bringing y'all that third part on next Monday. Well, thanks for listening tonight, y'all. And I hope you have an awesome week in this first week of August. And don't forget to come back on Friday night for What the Friday. Good evening and welcome to an all new episode of Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem. Before we get started tonight, I just want to apologize for not any new content last week. Um, it was a rough week. Um, you might remember that I found the two lumps on Ariel. And we were waiting to see if any of them grew. And the one on her side did grow. So, um, it was tested and we found out that it is cancer. So, that was news, of course, that I didn't want to hear. But, um, you know, when I adopted her, I knew that it could come back. You know, she could have cancer again. Because you may remember I told you that when I um, adopted her, she was recovering from having an enormous tumor removed but um so i mean i knew it could happen but you know how you have that hope and wish that it doesn't happen again and it's still devastating when it does even though you knew but um the daughter feels like you know they can take care of it again and make her better they gotta wait for it to get just a little bit bigger before they can remove it so there's you know that waiting and whatnot and hopefully it's not spreading through her body but um so yeah that's that was my week last week so I was just spending some time with my sweet baby but um yeah so anyway if you've been listening over the past couple of weeks you know that we've been talking about the Murdoch case that's going on here in South Carolina right now and tonight I'm wrapping it up with what we know so far in the case or cases i should probably say against alex murdoch so without further ado let's get things started are you not here to be my mayor but for the victim it is real lies.
was in their own discretion. Okay, y'all, so before we dig back into the case, I'm just going to give y'all a little refresher, you know, a little recap on what we've talked about so far. Now, as far as we know, the story began when Alex's son, Paul, was charged with several felonies that stemmed from the Bowdoin accident that happened while he was heavily under the influence of alcohol and a 19-year-old woman named Mallory Beach which is the same age Paul was at this time she was killed in that accident well towards the end of episode 80 which was the first episode in this little mini series I mentioned that Alex Murdaugh had found his wife and son shot to death out by his dog kennels and during the investigation into that some information was found that reopened the investigation into the supposed hit and run death of Stephen Smith. Now, we don't know what that information was that was found, but it had something that maybe linked the Murdoch's somehow to the death of Stephen Smith. Well, eight days after Paul and Maggie were found shot to death, Alex and Buster announced that they were offering a $100,000 reward for any information that would lead to the arrest and conviction of whoever was responsible for the deaths of Maggie and Paul. The sled established a tip line for receiving tips and information on their deaths, and to be eligible to receive that award, you had to either submit your tip to sled through that hotline or by, or by calling Crime Stoppers by the end of September of 2021. Now, I don't know that I've ever heard of an expiration date on, on submitting tips to help solve a crime before, but as you know, this whole murder fiasco, it's not your cookie cutter crimes. There's just so many twists and turns. And then on last week's episode, I talked about how Alex was either forced to quit or he voluntarily quit from the family's law firm because he had been scamming some clients out of money. That includes the family of Gloria Satterfield, who was the nanny and housekeeper for the Murdoch family. She had been their nanny and housekeeper for over 20 years, I believe. And she had been killed while she was there at their house in what was called a trip and fall accident. And it seems that Alex promised Mrs. Mr. Satterfield's sons around $500,000 by suing himself but it ended up that he put all the money and it was like over four million dollars in this bogus bank account and those sons never saw a penny of it he also scammed several other clients in nearly the same way so after the family law firm found out that this was going on they either asked him to resign or they forced him to or maybe he just didn't on his own but then the day after he resigned, he called 911 and said that he had been shot in the head while he was pulled over changing a flat tire. Well, then he admitted later that he had gotten his, for lack of better words, drug dealer, Curtis Edward Smith, to drive by and shoot him so that he would die. And Buster his one remaining child would collect a 10 million dollar life insurance payout that buster wouldn't receive if alex had killed himself well after he's released from the hospital for that gunshot wound to the head alex checked himself into a rehab center in orlando florida and while he's there he gets slapped with a bunch of new charges now i also told y'all that mr satterfield's remains will be exhumed because there's a lot of questions about why an autopsy was never performed and why the coroner was never called in to like investigate her death and right now there's still no date that's been set on when this is supposed to take place but we know that it could take several weeks or many weeks for the results once it does take place let's see like I said, there's just so much to this, and it's really 
unbelievable and it surpasses like anything we could have ever imagined it's kind of like a, a lifetime movie and i'm sure there will be one now before i jump into this year's events in the case there's a couple of things that i have failed to mention but i want to talk about them now now on september the 20th of last year connor cook you might remember me talking about him in the first episode of this movie series he was one of the victims in the um, boat crash that involved Paul. He filed a lawsuit in Hampton County, and it's not just Alex Murdoch that he Mur- Murdoch that he's suing. He's also um, na- he also named Buster Murdoch, Gregory M. Parker Incorporated, which is the company that owns the convenience store that Paul bought the alcoholic beverages at and an employee at, um, that worked at Parker's or it was an employee of Parker's um, and that employee's name is Tajia Cohen for, and now this is because they did pay somewhat of a role in, in this boat crash and you might remember me telling you that Connor as he's being rolled down the hall going to surgery for the injuries that he sustained in that boat crash Alex is walking along with him urging him basically not to rat his boy out well anyway later on you know that same month um, of September on the 30th a family representative responded to claims of the marital issues that had came out between Maggie and Alex and this is what they said and it's a quote okay so the most recent allegations by people magazine regarding the state of maggie and alex murdoch's marriage are totally inconsistent with what we have been told by friends and family members also we have reviewed many years of text messages on alex's phone and the conversations between alex and maggie portray a very loving relationship it is our hope that the media will continue to focus on covering the investigation of the person or people responsible for the murder of Maggie and Paul and not reporting salacious stories with no credible sources connected to the Murdoch family. And that's the end of that quote. Well, then on October the 6th, the PMPD law firm files a lawsuit against Alex suing him for damages that came from him taking money from them and clients and it's believed that he conspired with some friends who were an attorney and a banker to scam money from the Satterfields well two days later on the 8th the South Carolina Supreme Court suspended the law license of Corey Fleming who is that attorney friend that Murdoch is accused of conspiring with so then on the 14th, and this is in October, y'all, Alex comes out of rehab and he's charged with two counts of obtaining the property by false pretenses in connection with Gloria Satterfield's wrongful death settlement. He's extradited back to South Carolina and on the 19th of October, a bond hearing is held and the judge rules that he'll be held in custody pending a psychiatric evaluation. So there's that. Well, on November 4th, Alex and Curtis Edward Smith are indicted by the Hampton County Grand Jury on multiple charges in connection to the assisted suicide plot, and Alex is denied bond again, which is still pending the psychiatric evaluation. Well, later that same month, he's indicted on 30, yes, 30 charges that stem from the Gloria Satterfield wrongful death settlement and how that's 30 charges for just that one case and I wonder if Alice is ever just sitting in jail thinking about what he's up against and he forgets to include a case or two and he's like oh shit yeah there's that too so, you know I don't know how he could keep up with all of it because you know we are having a hard time keeping up with it ourselves but um yeah well, then at the beginning of December of last year, another victim in the boat crash, Anthony Cook, he files a lawsuit against Alex 
Gregory and Parker Incorporated, Parker's Corporation, and Tajia Cohen, which, like I said, is an employee of Parker's. So these lawsuits just keep rolling in. And that year, or last year, it couldn't end without adding one more slap on the wrist to Alex Murdoch. He's given a $7 million bond for the charges from South Carolina grand jury indictments. And, of course, this infuriates him. And his defense attorney, um, he's just trying to defend his client, of course. But, you know, he tells him that, you know, Murdoch can't afford a bond like that because he's as broke as the rest of us. So, you know, Merry Christmas, Alex, because you're spending in jail. All right, so now it's this year, 2022, and you'd think there couldn't possibly be any more charges to be pressed against Alex Murdoch, and then boom, y'all, more hits the fan. Now, I do want to tell you now that since a lot of this is recent, there's not a whole lot of details that's been released on some of it just yet, but I'm going to tell you what we do now. So, in January, Dick Harputley, and that's um, Murdoch's attorney, he asked the judge for a reduction in that bond, and he tells the judge that Alex is so poor he can't even pay his own phone bill. The judge thinks on it for a couple of weeks, but in the end... That that denial was that request was denied. Gosh, I can't talk this morning or this evening. Um, now Murdoch gets slapped with 23 more charges by the South Carolina grand jury, and this time it's for a breach of trust and computer crimes. And those computer crimes tie into those charges of like defrauding clients out of money. Well, later that month, the Moselle property, which is property that Maggie and Paul were found murdered on went up for sale for $3.9 million and in an effort to keep Alex from collecting any money from the sale of that estate Mallory Beach's mom Morgan Doty and you know that was um, Paul's girlfriend at the time of that boat crash and Miley Altman they filed creditors claims totaling $65 million and $50 million of that being from Mallory's mom. Now, on Valentine's Day of this year, Morgan Doty, like I said, she was the girlfriend of Paul Murdoch at the time of that boat crash. She filed her own lawsuit against Alex Murdoch, Buster Murdoch, the estates of Maggie and Paul Murdoch, and Parker's. Now, Doty's lawsuit alleges that there was negligence against Parker's for failing to notice that Paul was underage, even though he had his brother's driver's license. And his daddy's credit card to purchase that alcohol. Now, the, loose, the lawsuit also says that Maggie and Alex were actually aware of Paul's drinking problem. They did absolutely nothing about it. And photos on social media that depict Paul consuming alcoholic beverages, they were liked by his own mom, Maggie. And these have been referenced in the case so I guess her um, liking his his drinking photos on social media you know that shows that she knew something about it and didn't do anything about it but um early in the spring it was kind of quiet for Alex but then on May the 4th the South Carolina grand jury indicted Murdoch Corey Fleming that was that attorney friend of his and a former bank CEO a man named Russell Lucius fit. I, I'm thinking I'm saying that's wrong, but or how I'm pronouncing it's wrong. But anyway, now they were slapped with a total of 30 criminal charges, and that banker uh, CEO, the former one, he is accused of conspiring with Murdoch to defraud victims of 1.8 million dollars. Now, see what I mean about it? Just going on and on and on. It just don't stop. And I guess he's feeling defeated or that he didn't have a choice. On May 31st, he signed a confession of judgment warning the family of Gordy Satterfield $4.3 million. So maybe, you know, just maybe a little bit of justice for um, at least one of the Murdoch family victims. 
it's starting to slowly trickle in and it just depends on what is found when they exhume Gloria Satterfield's body. But that family may get, a, you know, more justice in the future. I guess it just depends on what they find when they do exhume her body and autopsies and whatnot. Well, about a year and a week after the deaths of Maggie and Paul, South Carolina Supreme Court announces that it wants to revoke Alex's law license due to the overwhelming evidence that he stole millions of dollars from his clients, plus the 70 plus criminal charges that haven't been resolved yet. Now, Alex's attorney didn't dispute that, so, you know, that was that. That was finalized, and Alex was disbarred on July the 12th. Well, on June 28th, a ton more charges against Alex poured in that range from money laundering to criminal conspiracy. And then there's narcotics involved in this too, y'all. For these indictments, prosecutors laid out that there had been an eight-year money laundering and painkiller ring. Apparently, they had been conspiring to purchase and distribute oxycodone and this took place in Colleton County from October the 7th of 2013 to September the 7th, 2021. So stuff with the Murdochs has been going on for quite some time. But then the calendar flips to July 14th. And the entire state of Carolina, maybe even the entire nation, heard the words they've been waiting to hear. Murdoch was indicted on two counts of murder and the death of his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. Now, it was almost like the South ex exhaled, like, all at one time. So we've been kind of, like, holding our collective breath, waiting on that indictment, and we finally had it. But now we hold it again while we wait for this circus to go to trial. Well, three days after he was indicted for those murders, he's brought into a Colleton County courtroom, and surprise, surprise, he enters a plea of not guilty. Yeah. I mean, of course he would. I mean, he's never admitted guilt to anything, so why on earth would he say he's guilty of killing his wife and his own son? You know? Well, during the bond hearing for the murder charges, Harpootlian called for a speedy trial to clear Murdoch's name so they, that the authorities could go find the real killers, okay? Like I said, he did plead not guilty, but he agreed to stay in jail without bond. Now, Harpootlian said that Murdoch agreed to no bond so that they didn't have to go through a bond trial and risk new information about the killings being leaked. And that would, in turn, prejudice potential jurors when the case does go to trial. Well, Harpootlian went on to say that Murdoch would like to go on trial for those charges within the next three or four months. Show that Sled targeted the wrong man. However, the prosecutor in the case, his name's Creighton Waters, he thinks that such a timeline would be very aggressive. And not only did he say that, but he said that all evidence points back to Murdoch including forensic and other evidence. And the defense also requested a, a gag order to be put in place to prevent, you know, members of law enforcement and attorneys from talking about the case to the media, but the judge later denied that request. And as for a trial within the next three to four months, that remains to be seen. Well, so, just to let you know, as of August the 5th of this month, Alex Murdoch, he's facing a total of 88 charges. Now, I do have to say, just before I got ready to record this episode, y'all, it was announced that there would be a bond revocation here in Fort Curtis Edward Smith, and that was to take place on August the 11th, that was last week. So. I decided to wait and see what the outcome of that was so I could include it on this episode. Well, when Smith's bond trial was held after his arrest, he told the, the judge that, and this is his quote, I ain't got 
I ain't gotten him in. And that's when he was asked about the state of his finances. Well, after some investigating, it was found that in the weeks before his bond was issued, he'd had $58,000 in his checking account. And that money came from an insurance settlement of $70,000 from an alleged fire at his shop. Now, anybody out there want to take any guess on who represented him in that case? Anybody? Anyone? Well, it was Alex Murdoch. I mean, the easy peasy to guess, right? And also at that revocation hearing, prosecutors voiced concerns that Mr. Smith had been violating his monitoring terms. Apparently, he's got a ankle monitor, bracelet, anklet, whatever you want to call it. But he'd been violating those terms by going to several different places while he was under house arrest. And so, I'm guessing they put him back in jail. But um, I knew more would be coming out sooner or later about this case. Um, it's just a big old mess you know <laughs> it's so messy but um it wouldn't surprise me if more didn't come out this week I mean it's just one thing after another in this case and of course I'll bring it to y'all you know because we can't leave out any details of this messy messy case but anyway now like I said this is going to be as far as I know, the last episode until, you know, more is released or when the trials start, whatever. But, um, you know, that could be this fall or it could be this week. It, like I said, you don't know because it's just so crazy. So hang tight. I have a feeling there will be more updates on this case soon. And that's all I have for tonight. I want to thank y'all for listening and I want y'all to have a great week.